<laughs> our panelists are Joanna Kosmuta and Dave Blevin. Please have your seats, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Joanna is the industry innovative lead in the space portal at NASA Ames Research Center there in Silicon Valley, and also the microgravity lead for the Emerging Space Office at NASA headquarters. Sorry to hear that. Um, providing fair broker technical economic, oh, I'm sorry, that was an editorial, it's not politically correct. Providing fair broker technical economic market and business intelligence. I think you has got her job cut out for you. Mr. Blevin is the managing director of Cottonwood Technology Fund. He's based in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and is over 25 years of private equity operating and investment experience. Mr. Blevin has successfully made and managed investments in over 30 private technology-based companies. He's been an early sponsor of companies representing almost $1.5 billion in realized enterprise value. The panel is entitled, Turning Microgravity into a Billion Dollar Business. What would J.P. Morgan or D.D. Harriman do? Please welcome our panelists. We have three minutes for the panel chair and then four minutes for each of the panelists. And then I'll be back with questions. Okay. I had to add the J.P. Morgan because I had just D.D. Harriman, but the thought was there wasn't enough science fiction fans in the audience, so put J.P. Morgan in there. The purpose of this panel is, is I wanted to get, give you guys a different perspective on what we're doing. Um, obviously, we've had some hiccups as we go forward. We have product that's superior to what you can make on, on the ground. We've built devices, and we're still having an acceptance problem in industry. And the acceptance has been along the lines of, sure, it works in practice, but can you make it work in theory? Which is kind of the opposite of what you'd expect. But the reason, really what's happening is, they're looking at our device results, and they're saying, well, yeah, yeah, those are good, but it doesn't fit what I know about silicon carbide, so I don't believe you. It's gotta be something else going on. So we set up, we set up independent research panels to go, go out and analyze our material before and after flight, do the structural analysis, do electrical analysis, so that now we can go to industry and say, it's not us, it's these guys that are doing it. Um, one of the people that couldn't be here was uh, Debbie Sineski. She runs Extreme Environments Lab at Stanford University, and she's the head of our research panel. She had to go to uh, DC for some, uh, some funding stuff. But her lead researcher, Sambav, is over here. Um, and so if you have any technical questions, fire them his way. You can fire them at me, but you'll get the correct answers if you talk to Sambav. Um, Dave is here to give you kind of perspective on what, what does he look at when he's investing in these kind of ventures. And what Joanna is doing is basically taking an approach of how does this all fit with the NASA commercialization concept? because we're all commercial. We didn't take any funding from the government. We had nothing to do with NASA, DOD, anybody. It's all commercial. So she's taking an independent look at all this and doing her own kind of evaluation. So to get it going so we have time for uh, questions later, I have a couple questions for them, and that'll allow them to get, get warmed up and, and give you guys a flavor. And I'll start with Dave. So Dave, your firm has been successful with early stage investment, high risk, high payoff. So, like us. So how do you distinguish? For, for the people that want to start, what's a good idea? What's a bad idea? What do you do? Yeah, so again, Cottonwood is uh, based here in Santa Fe. Before I moved here, I ran a fund uh, or series of funds in North Carolina, about 180 million, focused on information technology investing. And, and here with uh, Cottonwood, and we also have a fund now in the Netherlands, by the way, and so we're really expanding our footprint. Um, but we look in for, uh, in our minds, technologies and usually at the uh, hard science, new materials, photonics, robotics, um, some health sciences stuff that we believe has disruptive potential. And so we're looking at usually what we would think of as off the curve innovation, things that never been done before, or at least never been done in the way it's being done. Uh, microgravity materials <laughs> fits into that. Um, and uh, looking at, What's a low cost path in most cases to proving that the technology really can work? And, and, and again, as you heard earlier with uh, Sunil, you know, what, who cares how big is the market opportunity? So if we, we try to find things that we think are, are totally unique, 
but have a disruptive impact if it works. Um, and so we're not focused just on space. We're really focused very broadly, and, and, as, and as they also heard from Sunil, as their firm is as well, everything we look at has sort of that bar, a uh, common bar that's not relevant to whether it's uh, microgravity or whether it's some other kind of material or a photonics. It's all re um, related to what's the market opportunity and how likely it is that, that we can um, execute on this. And for us, because we're a small fund, how likely is it that we can figure out something meaningful that will make an impact to the potential customers uh, for, rare, for very little capital initially. Almost all of our companies ultimately need a lot of capital. We've got some photonics companies that one that's raised over 70 million at this point, but we put up the first two million in partnership with Sun Mountain. And, um, and we were able to identify through working with the entrepreneur some low uh, or some quick, um, if you will, uh, milestones that could be accomplished fairly inexpensively that would prove that what they had in mind could in fact be done. Uh, similar here with this, uh, we, we tried to explore with Rich initially what can be done fairly quickly, fairly inexpensively that will start to prove that what you're talking about actually will work and that people will be convinced it will work and we can start talking to customers. So I'll stop there with that okay. uh, particular. And next to Joanna, and she, she's providing the independent, uh, one of the many independent looks here. So what criteria are you looking for when you evaluate concepts like this? What, what is important for you? So I guess I wouldn't, um, first of all, thank you for the empathy um, regarding uh, doing this through NASA. However, I would definitely give credit to Alex McDonald here um, and his endless support in uh, really trying to keep this fair broker unbiased, given uh, that we have to operate in a bureaucracy that we're all aware of. Not only that, but I would also try to put out here the fact that NASA in general operates right now in a politically suffocating environment. Um, and that um, I think affects from launch to microgravity. Um, so I think the first, definitely the difference between ACME and uh, fiber optics manufacturing in space, which is an, another company that uh, we're working with, uh, is the fact that you've totally manage this independently. And so coming again from a NASA perspective, I see a lot of people, a lot of space enthusiasts who say, well, but our technology is TRL level seven and higher. And so here's a distinction. When you talk about technology readiness level and in aerospace, we heavily use that and you know, we get the government and aerospace. Um, Choosing to mature a technology is usually for use in a NASA program. And even if you reach a tier level seven or higher, right? I mean, like HIAD that ULA was talking earlier, it's, it's a very high TRL technology. There's no market for it. So TRL doesn't work out there in the marketplace. So you look for, go, going back to Sunil or for what Dave said, what is the pool for it? Who wants it? Even if you have it, do they understand the use for it? And my work through ESO and through the space portal was to go out and talk to industries, to, to um, companies in the private vertical, spin-offs, startups, and there's really very low awareness. Not only that there's low awareness and understanding, but there's very, it's very difficult to close that loop. Um, and coming from the aerospace, we do not keep in mind that in order to find an investment and move a technology into the marketplace, we have to look into the technology risk as function of financial investment. Now, the scale of financial investment in aerospace is really, we really need to plot it on a log scale versus if you were in the VC world, because the investments that they're talking about, they're willing to do, are way less than what we're used to in the aerospace. So I think looking at the technology risk versus the financial investment. So, so the extreme of this would be infinite resources. You can take a technology to market because you can build all the ecosystem around it and the infrastructure, but that defeats the purpose. 
So I think here's where we are, a reality of facts with, with the commercial microgravity. It's not like the technicalities aren't there, but right now there is no fully focused mechanism in trying to make this work and creating the pool that's needed on the industry side. Yeah, I think that's, that's right. The time. Um, I, w I want to go to questions real quick, but I had one, one more quick one for Dave. We, we discussed this, and this is again for all you that, that are thinking about going forward with the venture. What should you not do when somebody's pitching you? What are the bad things? Yeah, well, I think there's, a, I mean, uh, you know, all technology companies are generally started by technology people, and, um, and so they really understand the technology. I would say, you know, coming to, you know, as Sunel mentioned earlier, um, we, we eventually want to really understand the details of the technology, not that we'll ever fully understand it, but um, we really want to understand how we're going to make money. Um, and so, as he said, I mean, I see a lot of people walk in with 40 slides and 30 of them or 35 of them are related to the technology. Um, very little attention is paid to the business model, how big the market is, who really cares? I mean, who are the buyers and why are they gonna buy this product? I mean, how much pain does it solve? Have you talked to customers already? Um, very rarely do the people that come in my office answer yes to that question. A lot of times the technology is developed in the sense of they know what the customers might want or they know what the market might want because they're in, the, they're in that industry. But nevertheless, I think it, it runs the risk and, and often you see this of developing a product and then introducing it to customers only to find out that those customers are interested but that's not in exactly what you built. Um, and so what we try to do from the very beginning is talk to customers uh, before we ever even invest and understand how interested are they, uh, but most importantly, what does the technology have to do from a performance standpoint that would get them to then want to buy it. And so, you know, I think from in terms of what not to do, it's, it really has to do more with, especially in a first meeting, you know, a few slides on your technology really focused on what is unique about it and, and why does it solve a problem that no one else can solve. Um, and then it gets to how big is the market and all these other things that have to do with building a business. Because um, I always assume for the most part that the technology is going to work. And in fact, in every case that we've invested, the technology did work. And so the people almost always, and in fact, in this case, every, in every case, they can build the product. Um, but that doesn't mean that much necessarily unless you can also sell the product and build a company. And, I, I, and that would be my advice is focus on those second two things more than you focus on the first thing. Uh, that can always be covered in a second meeting if you get past this is a big opportunity and here's why. Then it's like, okay, tell me again how the technology works. You can get to that in subsequent meetings. The, the other point okay. that we, I think we touched upon and you recognize its value was that um, a lot of the pitches go to the VC with the expectation that the VC will fill in the market and who's going to use it. And I think that's really uh, an unreasonable expectation because I think the way to attract attention on the VC side is you actually tell them, okay, I have a technology, I will tell you about later, but here's how I can make you a 5 ROI or 10 ROI in this timeline, and I already have some customers lined up, right? I mean, uh, that's probably... Yeah, and usually what that means is... Um, don't be greedy. Get a partner that knows the business side, too. If you know the tech or there's two of you that know the tech, bring somebody in that can help with this part of it, and, the, and then the venture side will go a lot smoother. So I think, unless there's something else, we're ready for questions.